Network innovation is essential if CSPs are to remain competitive and offer the dynamic, agile and scalable services that are going to be a prerequisite for the digital service provider. Yet the sources of this innovation remain elusive. If they can't do it themselves or their existing vendor partners come up short, then where do they turn? Startups would be the obvious answer, but it's not as easy as you might think. Well, joining me now from San Jose to discuss the issues is Andrew Coward, CEO of Lumina Networks. Andrew, good to speak to you on Telecom TV again. Okay, nice to see you. Um, let, let's get to the heart of the issue here, which is you know, why we aren't seeing more startups becoming involved with, with telcos. Um, last year, I believe we saw a record amount of venture capital invested and deployed, but only a small percentage of that is making its way into telco infrastructure. So, so what's going wrong? Well, I think um, for the general VCs, they're very concerned about putting money into telco startups because it takes an extraordinary long period of time um, to kind of see that money come to fruition in terms of getting products out um, and deployed at, at large scale in telcos. So, so once that happens, then it's great. It's just that there's a very, very long time frame and, and you know, a great number of risks down that path. So uh, I'd argue that they've been very gun shy about going um, into this market, um, particularly at this point in time. Do the telcos themselves share some of the responsibility here by having their, their procurement cycles and their, their very long sales cycles? Um, they do, and I think they also recognise that you know they can be part of the solution as well um, in, in terms of having their own VCs and in terms of making their own investments. Um, however, it hasn't brought in the VCs from the sidelines, at, at least not yet. Um, despite the fact that you know there's a great deal of innovation that's required for 5G um, to be successful. So where, where are we seeing money deployed at the moment? Is it more towards um, over-the-top services rather than the actual infrastructure? Well, that's right. There's this kind of assumption that you know 5G is already there; it will be soon, and so a lot of the investments are going into all the fun stuff that we're going to do on top of it, um, whether it's augmented reality, whether it's you know low latency services, all those types of things, um, or connected car, or whatever it happens to be, but not the actual infrastructure um, that's going to be needed to deliver these services. What about the telcos themselves and their own internal investment teams? What are they doing to try and help alleviate the the problems? Yeah, well, I mean, the good news on, on that is that the, the, pretty much every large um, telco has had some level of investment or, or wanting to invest in the industry. Um, the challenge is they've actually been kind of following the VCs and investing in the things that run over the top and not necessarily in the infrastructure business. Um, and, and so the, that kind of leads to the, cha the challenge. Um, but there's, there's kind of something more fundamental here, you know, th kind of through this, which is the default is that, um, you know, we'll stick to, or the telco industry will we'll stick to the traditional vendors in trying to deploy all these 5G services. And, and we're going through some very major um, technology transformations as we move to 5G. And, and that's kind of where the, if you like, the technology debt is, is starting to build. And I think that should be concerning for everybody in the industry. So from an investment perspective, as we move towards 5G, it doesn't look like we're, we're adding a lot of value here at this stage. Well, right. So, I mean, some basic things have obviously been done and done very well. The radio, for example, um, and, 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 the, and the back all the kind of basic infrastructure. Um, but in the five, what's called the 5G core, where many of these services are going to be delivered, there are some key things that, that have to happen. Um, you know, one of the key tenants of 5G is that we'll be able to basically um, segment the network to give a slice of that network to different applications, you know, be it connected car, be it um, wind farms, um, be it um, gaming and so on. Um, or to put it another way, everybody who wants it gets their own network, if you like, of that slice. And there's a lot of infrastructure and changes that, that, that need to be delivered to, to go through that. Um, you know, and I kind of put this parallel um, back in the days when mini computers were around. We had this massive movement from mini computers to, to Linux uh, and to PCs and servers. Uh, and we're going through that same transformation now, albeit you know, 25 years later. Um, so networking services for 5G have to be virtualized and have to run um, in a data center um, and not on proprietary uh, what look like you know, mainframe or mini computer systems as, as we used before. So um, what's challenging is that um, there aren't a lot of new vendors who've come up with um, you know, technology and software that runs in that world. The expectation is the traditional vendors 
uh, will magically transform their products to run in this new world. And that's proving a lot harder than, than people expect. Um, and, and that's why we're seeing you know, some of the challenges. For example, the delays in deploying NFV are largely because the traditional vendors um, either haven't moved their technology onto x86, onto Intel compute at the performance levels that are needed, or are pricing it higher than um, the traditional products that they have. Um, so they are kind of being brought down this path very reluctantly. And traditionally, you'd see a whole lot of startups come in and basically kind of take over, if you like, and, and come up with new products that, that are designed for this kind of cloud native um, approach. And that's just not the case right now. So is this vision that we've had for a number of years now of a more open ecosystem, it, it's, not, it's, not actually, it's not actually appearing as, as we want it to. It's not turning out the way we want it to. Or maybe it's just happening more slowly and, and you know, we're not going to get to 5G as fast as, as, fast as we expect. Um, I think you know, as, as the 5G radio gets deployed, as um, the infrastructure is there, um, then the, the kind of realization of this technology debt um, it will build and, and something will have to give. Um, and that's really the question of you know, how do we catch up at that point? Because you know, if we don't solve this problem and solve it soon, then none of the new revenue streams that the carriers are expecting to show up on these 5G networks for all these new IoT devices and new services just won't be there. And we'll just have a much faster uh, network than we did with, with 4G. So, you know, meanwhile, the fate of the much hyped NFV is, is somewhat in, in the balance here. There's, there's strong opinions on, on either side and the industry itself is working out whether or not to, we, that we need to jump into cloud native or do we integrate it as yet another architecture in what is becoming an increasingly crowded hybrid network. I, I'd imagine as, as a startup, it, it must be very difficult to place a, a long term bet here. Well, so as Lu at Lumina Networks, you know, we were very fortunate um, because we were a spin out um, from Brocade. So we had three years inside Brocade and we got early support from AT&T and Verizon uh, who invested in our company and, and also our customers. So that was really critical. Um, and I, I think I said before, I would never do a startup in this space uh, under normal circumstances because it, it's just too hard. We had the kind of um, backing that, that enabled that to happen. Um, but when I look around um, at the competitors that we should have in the marketplace and other startups who should be supporting what we do, um, there's just not a lot that's out there. Do we need more clarity as an industry to where the industry is going with infrastructure, especially with the, the, the move to cloud native technologies so, so that the whole ecosystem is clear, what, maybe hopefully five years down the line that we will all en masse be moving this direction? Right. So um, again, I, I think from, from a technology perspective, where everybody knows what they have to do, that's not unclear. Um, the architectures there, three GPP standards, the, all of the kind of frameworks around that, it's just filling in the dots, if you like. Um, and so, uh, unless and until we get to that, um, we're going to have to wait for the traditional vendors. And, and there's also a, another danger here, which is that. Um, you know, if, if this becomes this breakpoint in the industry where we move to open source, where we move to an environment where um, you know, we've broken out of this framework of these, this kind of mini computer parallel environments, um, then we're going to miss that opportunity. And the carriers will have to make a choice about sticking with one major vendor, um, be it Ericsson, be it Huawei, be it Cisco, um, and, and be kind of locked back into that proprietary world for net yet another cycle. And, and that's what we're really trying to escape from at this point as an industry, I think. So it's becoming very clear that you know, business as usual for telcos is, is, is a bit of a recipe for a disaster, really. It's, it's, not, it's not the optimal strategy by far. And yet, long gone are the days of the flamboyant, risk-taking CEOs in this industry. It's very much a spreadsheet-driven mentality now. Do we, as an industry and as service providers, actually have the courage to, to make the necessary changes? Well, I think this is really speaking to what does need to change. Um, uh, you know, and we're seeing we're seeing the signs of that. For example, uh, Qualcomm announced a two hundred million dollar fund um, in five G. Um, so that's a great a great sign. Um, Telcos themselves kind of recognise this uh, and, are, and, are, and are trying to adjust. I personally think that a lot more money needs to be put um, into this from the telco side to to make sure that we we get the right outcomes. Um, and I think you know, for, for many startups who approach telcos for for investment, there's kind of three hurdles they have to go through. They kind of have to go through the, are you the next unicorn? Are you going to be the next billion dollar company? 
um, the, the regular test, if you like, um, that a startup would have to go through. Then they have to go through the, are you strategic to my business? Um, and, and really important for the future of what I do. And then thirdly, are you actually doing business with me today and selling product in, in there? Um, and, and so those become very hard tests for, for, for um, you know, any startup to go through. Um, and, and so an understanding of how um, that just becomes a little bit easier, if you like, the risk taking um, comes back to that uh, in a way that it did uh, when we went through, you know, the uh, 4G revolution or when we went through the broadband revolution, all those things happened at that point in time, albeit not with the telcos backing it. Because once the telcos come in with reasonable amounts of capital, the VCs will step off the sideline and join and we'll, we'll, we'll have the healthy ecosystem we, we all deserve and need. Nobody ever got fired for choosing IBM, eh? Well, until they did. And that's really, um, that's really what's gonna happen. Exactly, Andrew, thanks for joining us on Telecom TV. Appreciate talking to you again. Thanks, Guy.